Welcome back, my favorite Tzadikim and Hasidim. Hope you're doing well. As you know, in this series, we've been trying to explore this idea of the inner temple. First, we began with traditional Jewish sources going back to the first and second temple eras. So we know that there's some biblical foundations to this. We know that uh, in the Torah and in the prophets, God says that he would dwell among his people and that he would dwell in their midst, right? And this was debated. What does this mean? That he would just dwell inside the tabernacle and the tabernacle was inside the camp of the Israelites? What does it mean? Maybe something a little bit more. And we saw that with Second Temple era texts, like in the Dead Sea Scrolls and the writings of Philo, that these philosophically and mystically minded Jews, the way that they understood this is that God would dwell within a person. We also find this theology expressed in the New Testament as well, in the Christian literature. And so at first we looked into uh, the Gospels and the non or not the non-canonical, the non-Pauline epistles. In the second part of that uh, section of the New Testament writings, we also looked at the writings of Paul as well. And we found that this tradition of this inner temple doctrine has, is permeating um, not only normative Judaism, but even the early Christian movement as well. And so then in this particular episode that you're watching right now, I'd like to get into some Ebionite sources. And if you're not familiar with who the Ebionites were, uh, I recommend looking uh, for some more videos on that. We have some videos here on this channel that discuss the Ebionites. Uh, it's a little bit of a personal pet project of mine, or a favorite subject of mine. Uh, they're really interesting people. Essentially, they were the original Jewish followers of Jesus. And uh, over time, you know, they got into some things that were not quite uh, original or authentic to the original Jesus movement. And as you probably can pick up, I'm saying original, 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 authentic, or authentic. Uh, why am I saying this? And it's because even according to Christian sources, these people, the Ebionites, or in Hebrew, the Evionim, they were the first Jewish followers of Jesus. So if you want to get a taste for what they were really like, well, go back to their documents, go back to their writings. And this will give us a sense for what they believed, how they approached the subject, and for our purposes in particular, it will show us how this inner temple doctrine was permeating all parts of Judaism, including nascent Christianity, which, you know, as we know, it started out Jewish and then went its own way. But then also Ebionism, which essentially stayed Jewish, right? Maybe they're weird Jews, maybe they believe some heretical things sometimes, but halakhically, they were technically still Jewish, right? They were, at least according to the church fathers, they lived just like all the other Jews lived. And so if all the other Jews are kosher, halakhic, rabbinic Jews, it's somewhat safe to say, we can never say entirely, but we can say relatively safe to say that these Ebionite Jews, right? These aren't Christians, they're not anything. Yes, they happen to believe that a certain so-and-so was the Messiah, but they were Jews, right? They were halakhically Jewish, they were keeping the Torah in the Jewish way. And we even find this in the Gospel of John, that they, you know, buried Jesus according to Jewish custom, as it says, right? Why? Well, because they were Jews. They had <laughs> Christianity hadn't been invented yet for them to follow it, right? So if a religion hasn't been invented yet, they can't follow it, obviously. So this is what this episode is about. It's about those very, very early first and second century, primarily, Jewish followers of Jesus. They are not Christians. They're not normative Jews, but they're also not anything in between. They are Jews. Very, dis they're very definitely Jewish, and they're not Christians. They're very definitely not Christians. Now it can be argued, oh well, they believe that Jesus was the Christ. That's like, well, they weren't speaking Greek. They wouldn't have called him Christ. But even their concept of the Messiah very radically diff was different from normative Christianity, right? They didn't think that Jesus was God. They didn't believe in the virgin birth. They didn't believe in any of this stuff. These later, what I would argue, are pagan additions to that original thing that Jesus started, which, I mean, coming from a Jewish perspective, was actually much more kosher than the, uh, the religion that came afterwards, but that's beside the fact. 
So to begin our investigation into the subject, it's good for us to review, to look at, to very, very briefly study some of the Essene connections to the Ebionites. Now, it's known, according at least to the record of Epiphanius, who was a, let's say, I think he was living in the 380s, 390s, there about. He was living at the end of the 4th century, and he was documenting all of these horrible, evil, satanic heresies, including the early Jewish followers of Jesus. Oh my goodness, egads! And so he tells us what these people were like, at least up into the mid-300s. And maybe even the late 300s when he was writing. So some of the things that he says are, it's debatable as to whether they reflect the early movement, whether they reflect the latter movement. But when we study the whole topic out, we can deduce what's more likely and what's less likely. We won't be doing that here. Uh, maybe that's for another day. I'd actually really love to do some episodes on that. But we're not going to be doing it right now. Needless to say, in his book, The Panarion, which in Greek just means the, the, like the, the medicine cabinet, the medicine chest. Uh, he, basically, he considered his book a, a whole chest of uh, medicines and potions and elixirs to help heal all of these horrible heresioi, right? These heresies, which what's funny in Greek just means opinions, right? So you have opinions on something? You heretic! <laughs> I should start beginning all of these videos with... You know, welcome, my favorite Zadikim, Hasidim, and heretics. We love you here, all of you heretics. <laughs> Regardless. Uh, anyways, so getting to our first slide here. Um, the Essene connections between... Well, let's say this sounds redundant. The Essene connections between the Essenes <laughs> and the Ebionites. So, at least according to Epiphanius, which uh, we can take his testimony at face value, or we can question it a little bit, uh, I'll leave that entirely up to you. That's uh, your choice. But he does tell us something very interesting, and he says that the remnant of the Essenes who live in the area beyond the Dead Sea have been united with the sect of the Ebionites. Now, the time that he's talking about was the early 100s, so it's like the 120s, 130s, maybe the 140s. This was well into the second century. However, we also know that John the Baptist, or John the Baptizer, as he's sometimes called, that he also had very strong Essene connections, and some of his disciples went and joined the early Jesus movement, right? So, and I actually I have a video on this, that John the Baptizer had very strong Essene connections. And it's debatable as to whether he was actually an Essene himself, but he was very clearly Essenized. So, uh, what we do with that, I don't know. But one of the things that we can do with it is conclude that some of... How do you say this? It's not baptism, it's... Johnism, right? It's Baptistism, baptizerism. Uh, that some of his doctrines made, which were Essene doctrines, made their way into the the nascent Jesus movement. And so, very early on, we find that the early Jesus movement, or Ebionism, or Nazarenism, as it's sometimes called and described, that it was combining, you might say, normal Pharisaic Judaism or rabbinic Judaism, with certain Essene practices and beliefs. So, uh, the Pharisees, they would, in Greek, we'd say baptize, right? Baptizo. Uh, but in Hebrew, we'd say toivo, right? Or tovel. So the Pharisees would tovel, right? They would immerse. But the immersions of the Nazarene Ebionites were a little bit different. First of all, when you read their literature, they do it a lot more, right? It wasn't a one-and-done type of deal. And, interestingly, uh, the, uh, many modern Hasidim, right? Like uh, the, the Hasidim, the Haredim that are in these long black jackets and they have the long curly payas and the, the large, uh, the, the streimalach, the, the fur hats, right? Many of these types of Hasidim, the modern Hasidim, you might say, uh, they go to the mikveh every day, the, to the immersion pool, and they'll immerse every single day. And curiously, when you read the Ebionite writings, they do the same thing. And it's believed that this actually comes from the Essenes, which, according you know, to scholarly literature, they'll actually describe the Essenes as a Baptist uh, sect or movement, right? Baptist only in the sense that they, they baptize people. They would ritually immerse in water as a like, fundamental aspect of their practice. 
So, at least according to Epiphanius, in the 2nd century, early 2nd century, like I said, the 120s, the 130s, somewhere around there, uh, after the time of Elchai, which we're not going to get into who he is, but now you know, after the time of his preaching, then the Ess many of the Essenes came over and they joined the Ebionites. Now, at this time, the Ebionites were not living in Jerusalem anymore. They had actually moved to Pella and the Decapolis and all this whole area uh, near Jordan. And they stayed there, actually, for quite some time. In fact, that's possible even many centuries. So, here's another Essene connection. I'm, I'm dwelling a little bit too much on this baptism thing, uh, in this this merging of the sects thing. So, let's, let's move on to the next point. And the next point is that the leader of the Essenes was actually called a high priest. Believe it or not. Right? I remember the first time that I encountered this piece of information. I got these chills and I was a little giggly, like, Ooh, this is so cool, this is so amazing. Like, this is the stuff that you love to find when you're reading through this dense scholarly literature and then you find one of these gems, it's like, whoa, that's pretty cool. And so we find, actually, in one of the... Again, it's debated whether the Qumranites were actually uh, Essenes or not, but it's generally agreed that they were Essene-like. Right, so we can appeal to their text and say, well, it's, this is probably a very Essene belief or Essene thing to do. Might not have been mainstream Essenism, or Essenism, uh, <laughs> combined that with Messianism. Uh, they sound similar, though, don't they? So it might not be mainstream, it might not have been universally practiced, but it existed somewhere within the realm of broader Essenism. Probably. So... Uh, according to the Messianic Rule, which is document 1Q28A, uh, we, and this is part of the Dead Sea Scrolls, we read that their leader is actually referred to as the High Priest. In the, the passage that I just cited, I'm not quoting the passage, I'm saying that this is where the information comes from. Right, so their, their, their lead teacher, right, we know, probably many of you know that the, the leader of the Essenes, or the Qumranites at least, was somebody called the Morid Sedek, right? The teacher of righteousness. And there's lots of theories as to who this was. Some people actually say it was Jesus. Some people say it was James. Some people say it's uh, who knows who. Uh, it's some mysterious figure. But we know that this same teacher of righteousness was called the Kohen Harosh, right? The Kohen Harosh, which means the head priest, right? It's a little bit different than the biblical term, the Kohen Agodol, which means the great priest. But it, it functions the same way, right? Sometimes we'll find this. Like, sometimes we hear about Chag HaPesach, right? Festival of Pesach, of, uh, pa <clears throat> of Passover. And then sometimes we hear about this thing called Chag HaMatzos, which is the festival of matzah. Plural, matzahs. It's like, oh, there are these two different celebrations. No, it's being described in two different ways. It's kind of like... Uh, the Day of Trumpets is also called, uh, Yom Hatzrua is also called the Rosh Hashanah, right? Head of the year, or the new year, right? So we find and the same thing with Shavuot, as we know in Greek, it's called Pentecost. So we find that these observances sometimes have alternate names. For the Essenes, the Kain Harosh, or the, the, head, the head priest, was a synonym for high priest, right? Kain Godol. And as many of you will know, and probably will remember, the Essenes were, uh, it's believed anyway, that they were Zadokite priests who had uh, seceded from the temple establishment and had gone out into the wilderness uh, because they believed that the priesthood was, was becoming corrupt or had already been corrupted. Right? It's a little bit shrouded in mystery, but we get the general point that they disagreed with the temple establishment. And so we find that the Essenes perceived their leader to be a high priest in some sense. Maybe they thought that he was the legitimate high priest. Maybe they considered this a spiritual role. We don't know, unfortunately, although we'd love to. <laughs> so all we can do is say, well, they, they called their leader the high priest, right? Or the, the head priest, if you may. And this whole, this chief priest, uh, as it's said, and this is a quote, it calls him the chief priest of the whole community of Israel, right? So it's kind of like this idea of the, the Rosh B'nai Yisrael, right? Which spells out the word Rebbe, actually, uh, or Rabbi. And the Rosh B'nai Yisrael is the head of the children of Israel. And he's the leader of the generation. He's 
you know, the greatest tzaddik alive at that time. And it seems like the Essenes were kind of touching on a similar idea. We also find, and uh, the following quote is actually from Professor Rachel Elior. Uh, we also find that the, the Essenes, once they left the temple establishment, and especially once the temple was physically destroyed, it seems when you read, again, the Qumranite literature, that they believe that they that their rituals that they were doing in the desert, and this sounds so sanitized and so, I don't want to say disrespectful, but um, that the rituals that they were doing out in the desert, that their way of life, that their practices out in the wilderness had a connection to the heavenly temple and that they were somehow mirroring the heavenly temple service down here on earth to the best that they could outside of the physical temple. In other words, they believed that the priesthood and the temple had been moved to Qumran, right? So here's the quote from Professor Rachel Elior, which is a, uh, she's a Jewish professor out of, I believe, the Hebrew University, if I'm not mistaken, uh, or possibly Bar Ilan. But anyways, this is what she says. She says, having withdrawn as a consequence from the earthly temple, these circles who called themselves the son of Zadok, the priests, ministered in their mind's eye together with their angelic counterparts in a divine chariot throne which inspired by ezekiel's merkava vision and the tradition of the temple service they recreated in their writings in poetic and visionary terms or in other words to borrow language from a text that we will shortly be looking into the priesthood has been removed right not taken away but taken somewhere else right it's been removed, it's been transferred, it's been not abolished, as some translations of this text that Hebrews will say. It's been moved, it's been transferred. And this goes, it's connected with this Essene idea that the temple and its services, because the Jerusalem was corrupt in their view, that it had been transferred to these, this community of priests at Qumran, and possibly everywhere that the Essenes lived, I mean, who knows, but at least to the community at Qumran. And as we'll see, these Essene ideas of, you know, their leader, their Rebbe, being, in a sense, <laughs> the Morad Tzedek, the teacher of righteousness, that this teacher of righteousness being called the high priest, we'll find, has correlations with early Nazarene Ebionite practice, right? This idea that the temple and its services have been removed or transferred somewhere else, again, has correlations with early Nazarene Ebionite practice. So, I'd like to quickly go through these. These passages should be relatively familiar for most of us, uh, at least those of us who grew up in a Christian environment. So, we see in Revelation 3.12, we read, I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven. Right? So we find, again, we're not getting into full expositions of these passages, we are just looking for the doctrine of the inner temple, right? Or the inner Jerusalem, or the heavenly Jerusalem, or the heavenly kingdom, or the inner kingdom of the soul, the mind, of the heart, you know? And the, in this passage, that's exactly what we find. The city of my God, the new Jerusalem. And this is, of course, referring to the heavenly Jerusalem, the spiritual Jerusalem, which would metaphorically descend into our hearts from God. So that the people of Jerusalem, who even according to rabbinic accounts, you read this in the Talmud and you read this in other sources from that time and after, that the people of Jerusalem were going crazy. Like they had, uh, I hate to say mental illness, but they, they were just socially, everybody was on edge and they, everybody was just hating each other. We call this sinas chinam, which is baseless hatred, or sinat chinam. Right? Sinat chinam is, is just hating people for stupid reasons. You might say, well, I have a reason. He, 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 he looked at me funny, and I, I don't like him at all. I don't like him. Well, bah humbug. Right? Jewishly, that's considered no reason. A reason is a good reason. No reason can literally mean no reason, but it can also include a really stupid bad reason. So just because somebody looks at you funny, just because he didn't say hi to me yesterday, he gave me a weird look. Uh, he stinks sometimes. <laughs> These are not reasons to mistreat people, right? We need real Torah-founded biblical reasons 
for hatred, if we're to be hating people at all, which you know, there's occasionally times where we should be. But generally speaking, I mean, get along with people in society. Don't <laughs> don't be antisocial in the in the how do you say this? The professional sense, the academic sense, scholarly sense, uh, in the psychological sense. In the, meaning, you're doing things against society, right? It's not that you're shy. It's not that you're an introvert. It's that you're doing things that are counterproductive to civilization, right? And this this is what was going on at that time. People were just flipping out and going crazy, and we find this recorded in rabbinic literature, like I said from the time that people were just hating each other for no reason. You had the zealots just going up and stabbing people in the streets. You had some of the Pharisees trying to escape. You had some of the Pharisees supporting this new up-and-coming messiah called Bar Kokhba. You had the Sadducees who were colluding with the Romans to try to both preserve most of the nation, but then they were also turning people over to the Romans. Like they're double agents and playing both sides. You had the Herodians who were trying to Hellenize and Romanize the Jewish government, the provincial government, and everything was just chaos. You know, there's a Talmudic story where somebody wasn't invited. Well, it would take a little bit of explaining, but he was accidentally invited to a feast. The host sees him. He's like, what are you doing here? Get out of my feast. Right? I hate you. Right? These guys were enemies. And the guy came thinking, oh, you know, maybe, maybe my neighbor wants to have peace with me. I'll go to his feast and, you know, I'll meet him and uh, I, I, I'll feel uncomfortable because I don't feel like I deserve to be here. And the host looks at him. He's like, how did you get in here? The guy says, uh, didn't you send me an invitation? The guy's like, oh, I must have gone to the wrong person. Nonetheless, get out. I don't want you here. They bargain. He's like, oh, uh, uh, you know, I'll, I'll sweep up afterwards. No. Oh, I'll pick up all the chairs. No. Um, I'll, I'll pay you back for all the food that I eat. No. So then what happens? Right? And, and all of this is baseless hatred right here. Not letting somebody come to your party just because you're personal enemies? That's stupid. So this guy feels rejected, obviously, and, and naturally, too. I mean, I probably would, too. But then what he does is that he goes to the Romans and says, Hey, all these Jews at this party, they're actually planning on overthrowing the government. You want to go check them out? And so the Romans come in and they kill them all. That was also baseless hatred. And it's things like this that were going on in Jerusalem and in the surrounding area at the time. All right, that's the old Jerusalem. The Jerusalem that repents, they have a havis chinam baseless love for each other. They're like, you're a sinner and I love you. They're like, I'm a sinner and you love me? What are you, crazy? Yes, and I love you. <laughs> this is baseless love, right? And I have to say, Chabad is probably the best at this nowadays, or at least they're the ones that are popularizing it the most. A Jew is a Jew is a Jew. I don't care who you are, how observant you are. You're Jewish? Fantastic. You're, you're not even halfway there. You're 100% of the way there. You want to do some Jewish stuff? What do you mean, Jewish stuff? Oh, you know, like you know, do some mitzvahs or something? Oh, no, I'm not religious. Wait, you're Jewish, aren't you? Well, yeah, but I'm, I'm not religious, though. Okay, I mean, you don't have to do anything religious. You want to do some Jewish stuff, though? I mean, you are Jewish, after all. <laughs> and even the most secular Jews will come to Chabad, and, you know, they eventually from up, uh, a lot of them anyway, Baruch Hashem, and, uh, yeah, it all works out for the best. Comes with the <laughs> Anyway, moving on. Revelation chapter 21. This is a bit of a longer passage, so I'm not intending to comment on it too much. Verse 9 uh, through 23. It says, Then one of the seven angels who had come, or who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues, came to me and talked with me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem. Now notice, it's not just, ah, oh, yes, the holy Jerusalem. Ah, the city of Jerusalem. Oh, the great Jerusalem. It is saying that, by the way. However, the focus is not on the Jerusalem. The focus is on the holy. Right? This is the, the holy Jerusalem. It's not the unholy Jerusalem that had all of this brotherly hatred, all of this sinat chinam. It didn't have all of this stuff, this moral impurity, and also physical impurity, because the Romans were putting up idols. But that's beside the fact. We're talking about a pure Jerusalem that is fully done tshuva, that's fully repented, and everybody is loving each other, we're all getting along, we're all keeping God's commandments in unison, and uh, in unity is really what I meant to say. 
but we're all doing the same stuff together as one people. Right? It's like this. And also we have the phrase Lev Echad, where one man with one heart, right? One man meaning one human being. And continuing with the passage in Revelation, the city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. In her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And it goes on to describe the city. And then, picking back up in verse 22, it says, But I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are in it, are its temple. Wait, so God himself is the temple? The Lamb, which is presumably Jesus? Uh, that's the temple? The Tzaddik is the temple? How can this be? Right? Well, if we're talking physically, this is impossible. One, God's not physical. Two, Jesus' physical body is not a temple. You can't go into his body. I mean, well, we're not, <laughs> we're not going to go there, but the entire congregation of his followers can't go into his body on a physical level. This has to be spiritual, right? We're talking metaphorically, spiritually, allegorically, right? We're not talking about a physical reality here. We're talking about the temple of the soul, which, as we said, is, is follow, tells us, follow of Alexandria. He says, the temple of the mind, which means what? We're performing all of the things in the temple in a personalized, spiritual, um, I don't want to say recontextualized, but the practices do undergo some kind of transformation because we're not allowed to do the priestly services. Right, that's reserved only for the Levium and the Kohanim, the Levites and the priests. But we can take those practices for ourselves and tweak it a little bit in order so that they're different enough where we are halakhically, meaning according to the Torah, we can technically take those practices upon ourselves. It's like hand washing. Hand washing didn't become uh, mandatory in Judaism until after the destruction of the temple. And why is that? Because the priests used to wash their hands. And we do this to help keep the practice alive and well in the Jewish nation, right? So that doesn't mean, oh, well, I understand the reason, and other people will keep the tradition alive, so I don't have to, right? That's contrary to the halacha. We still have to wash our hands. But that was the basis for implementing this practice, right? It's to bring in those priestly traditions and, in a sense, again, build our inner temple. And now we're moving to one of my favorite EB night texts, which is the Clementine Hobbies. Uh, I could probably make lots of videos on this. Uh, it's funny because I, I'm i not a, I hate to say Jesus believer, because I believe in every Jew, right? <laughs> but in the sense that that's typically meant, I'm not Messianic, Christian, anything like that. Uh, but these texts, I, they're so interesting and fascinating. Maybe it's just because they're so different, but, um, but also it's because for the most part, by and large, there's some Hellenistic Greek pagan crap in these things, but by and large, they're actually really, really Jewish. Like, shockingly Jewish. So it's like, whoa, this is pretty cool. Anyway, so in these Clementine homilies, it at least purports to record the preaching of Peter, right? Simon Peter, the Apostle Peter. And so Peter, it says, Peter says to Clement, this is Clement of Rome, uh, Clement, my son, God is the only God, and master and father, pleasant and righteous, the creator, long-suffering, merciful, the sustainer, the benefactor, ordaining love of men, that is human beings, ordaining love for your fellow man, counseling purity, immortal and making immortal, incomparable, dwelling in the souls of the pleasant ones, and that cannot be contained and yet is contained. Right? God's infinite. He can't be contained. And yet he has said that he would dwell within us. How can, how can we contain God if God's infinite? Right? Well, that's a mystery. We're not going to be getting into that right now, although I'm sure that some of you would enjoy talking with me about that, as I would enjoy talking with that about you, or <laughs> talking with you about that. Although really, that is also true. Talking about this mystery is talking about all of us, right? And how we're all involved with God and our relationship with God. But also notice what he's saying. He's saying not only that God's infinite, meaning that he uh, cannot be contained and yet in some ways does appear to be contained. 
He says that God is dwelling in the souls of the pleasant ones. Right? Who are the pleasant ones? At the very least, it means the followers of Jesus, right? It means the righteous. Uh, possibly even beyond just the followers of Jesus to all righteous Jews. Or all righteous people in general, right? All people who purify themselves and create their... Uh, we'll use the general word here. They create themselves to be a temple, a dwelling place for God. So he says, dwelling in the souls of the pleasant ones. And yet again, we find that it is the soul that is the temple. It's not our fleshly, carnal, physical, material bodies. It's the soul, right? And again, in Jewish tradition, the soul includes the emotions, includes the intellect. These are different levels of the soul or different aspects of the soul, right? And again, this is a discussion for another day. We won't quite get into it right now. Uh, but needless to say, these are different aspects, or different levels of the soul. So we find that even in the Clementine homilies, which were written, it's, it's a little confusing as to when to determine the date, but it's believed that they are written sometime between about 280 to 320, thereabouts. So if you want a, just an even date, they were written about the year 300. So this is almost three centuries after the time of Jesus, which is phenomenal. It's amazing. Now, I'd like just for a moment to go back to this this contained and yet is not contained passage, or the, the, this phrase. This is remarkably similar to something that we find in the Tanakh, which not only shows the antiquity of this doctrine, but it shows also how Jewish this doctrine really is, right? So compare this latter part of the passage with the biblical verse in 1 Kings 8, verse 27. And it says, And Solomon prayed, Will God indeed dwell upon the earth? Even heaven, the highest heaven, cannot contain you, much less this temple I have built. And yet we find that God's presence, the Shekhinah, does dwell between the cherubim, right? Or the cherubim, the, uh, the angelic figures on top of the Ark of the Covenant, right? Whenever, the, speaking of the Kayan Godel, the high priest, whenever he'd go into the Holy of Holies on Yom Kippur, he would offer the incense, he'd do his thing, and he would see a physical, or we might at least say visual, representation of God's presence between those two cherubim, cherubim, right? There's, there's lots of fascinating things to be said about that, as you can probably imagine. But again, we don't have time for that. And as you know, I have a tendency to, to ramble. So let's not ramble, but instead go on to the Acts of Thomas, which I was debating whether to put in this into one slide or two slides. Um, but if it's a little bit too small for you on your phones, I do apologize. Uh, you might just have to bear with me on this one. So in the Acts of Thomas, uh, I'm using, oftentimes I'm going to be using the Syriac edition, at least for the first passage here. So the Acts of Thomas, 87 through 88. Again, we find this recurring theme of an inner temple. Of course, because why would I be including it in this presentation if it wasn't? Anyways, so it reads, And the Apostle said, this is the Apostle Thomas, I do pray and entreat for you all, brethren, that believe in the Lord, and for you, sisters, that hope in Christ, that in all of you the word of God may tabernacle, and have his tabernacle therein, because you are given power over your own souls. You have power over your own souls, meaning what? means that we have free will, right? We are allowed to make good decisions. We have the strength and the ability, the power, to make good decisions. Some people will say, oh, no, everything is predestined and everything is determined by, by nature and nurture, right? Or some people will say, oh, it's all astrologically determined by the zodiac. No, we have free will. We have the ability and the power. You might even say the, the, the right and the obligation to choose good and evil, right? Even in Deuteronomy, it says, I set before you this day life and death. Choose life. Right, so God's giving us the option, but he's also guiding us what to choose. Now also notice the parallelism that this author of the Acts of Thomas creates. He's talking about God tabernacling therein, you know, within a person. And he says, because you have power over your souls. Again, it's because the tabernacling of God occurs within the soul, right? You have the power to purify your soul. You have the power to turn your soul into an inner temple. And if you have that power, then do it, right? Prepare your inner temple and allow God to come in. 
and as the text says, to tabernacle therein, right? Acts of Thomas 93. Uh, this is beginning in the, the middle of a passage, so forgive me if the first part doesn't make much sense, but fortunately, uh, we don't need to necessarily know the first part. It says, the woman which had received the Lord in her soul, right? The woman received the Lord in her soul. So when you receive something, you need to put the, you need to put the object somewhere. Right? You receive an apple, you can put it on the counter. You receive a book, you put it on the shelf, right? You receive the Lord, you put it in your soul. Or it, you put the Lord in your soul. And the apostle said, truly and surely, the Lord has risen upon her soul. For greater is he, is he whom she has received into her soul, if she has indeed received him. Meaning it's like, if you've truly received the Lord in your soul, then it is a truly great thing that you have received, right? And again, this just goes back to show that people are receiving the Lord into their souls. This idea of the Lord tabernacling in the soul. Now in the Acts of Thomas, as far as I remember anyway, I haven't read it in a little while. But usually when it's referring to the Lord, it's, as I said, usually referring to Jesus. Although many times it is ambiguous as to what exactly they mean. And in some of these non-canonical acts, there is, I don't want to say confusion, although that is technically the right word. There is some equivalency being drawn between Jesus and God because they see, again, that's not even technically correct either. They see the Christ spirit within Jesus. And again, if this, if this is going over your heads, I do apologize. Uh, but for those of you who have studied a little bit of Gnosticism and a little bit of uh, Ebionite Christology, they believe that, and this is an extremely Jewish belief. It's in fact what Jews do believe that there is a messianic spirit and then it comes into a person and then that person becomes the Messiah, right? But fundamentally, it's the spirit of Messiah, the Ruach HaMashiach, that makes the person the Messiah in the first place. And so just as it said that Jesus received a dove at the Jordan River, the Ebionites said, oh, he's receiving the messianic spirit, right? He's becoming the Messiah at that point. And so in some of these non-canonical acts, that's just what they're called. That's the, the genre. It's like there's poetry, there's gospels, there's, uh, there's history, and then there, there are acts of the apostles. Uh, so in this Acts of Thomas and in various other acts, they seem to be equating the, this messianic spirit, which sometimes they call the Lord, sometimes they even just call Jesus, which can further confuses matters. They seem to be drawing an equivalency between this Lord, right, the, the messianic spirit, uh, which is even sometimes called the Holy Spirit, curiously, uh, they seem to equate this with God. So understand that it's, I don't know if I'd say the way that they're describing it is exactly kosher, but the the basic idea, the fundamental idea is still actually very kosher. Now, God and presumably his extensions and his emanations, uh, that they dwell within the tabernacle of the soul, the temple of the soul, right? Or again, to repeat another point. As Philo says, the temple of the mind. In the Acts of Thomas 94, it says, The apostle said, Our souls give praise and thanks unto you, O Lord, for they are yours. Our bodies thank you, which you have counted worthy to become the dwelling place of your heavenly gift. Blessed are the bodies of the holy, for they have been made worthy to become temples of God, that Messiah may dwell inside them. Again, I don't even have to explain this because it's using all the right words. It's using the keywords like temple of the soul, temple of the body, uh, or blessed are the bodies of the holy, for they have been made worthy to become temples of God, right? Now you can say, oh, see, it is talking about bodies now. Again, you need, this needs to be interpreted in the way that the authors meant it. The authors knew that there was a physical body and a spiritual body. Which body are they talking about? We don't know. But earlier in the same book, it says that God's dwelling in the soul. So now they're saying that God dwells in the body. Well, which body? Right? Well, which body relates to the soul? It's, it's, the, it's the spiritual body. I think. Come on. So this is the context of passages like this, where it says that God dwells in the body. Right? It's the spiritual body. What is the spiritual body? It's your soul. Right? That's what Paul means when he talks about the inner man. Right? The inner person, the inner human being that dwells inside you. It's not this physical thing. It's the spiritual thing. 
right? And we see how this, this concept of the inner temple is further messianized to say that God dwells there and Jesus dwells there. Because again, if he's seen as a high priest of the inner temple, and the inner temple's within you, well, logically, it seems like a reasonable thing to deduce given their premises. And again, the final one, the final passage from Acts of Thomas, this is 127. And he says, it is impossible to root out him that is held in her soul. Again, passages before the last one and now this after the body passage. They're both saying that God's dwelling within the soul. Again, further alluding to the idea that the author is talking about the spiritual body within us, right? We talk about an inner temple. We have an inner person, right? We call that the mind. <laughs> You ever think thoughts to yourself? Do you ever narrate anything? Do you ever plan anything out in your mind? That's your inner person talking to you. Right? And again, even this, the way that we're speaking right now, this is metaphorical language. Nowadays, we we sterilize a lot of this metaphorical language and we describe it psychologically, which is perfectly fine. I mean, if it's the truth and you're just describing the truth, as long as the description is accurate, then who cares? And now... Finally, on to the book of Hebrews, which I have to say is one of my more favorite New Testament books, uh, if I was to pick any, or if I were to pick any. English teachers, what's, which one's more grammatically correct? <laughs> anyway, so in Hebrews we find this idea of uh, the, this doctrine of the inner temple, along with the doctrine of the inner high priest, fully debuting in the canonical New Testament anyway. And as we full well know, Jesus is referred to as the high priest of the Nazarene Ebionites. It has it multiple times throughout the book of Hebrews. We're just going to look at a few passages. Uh, but this is very well known. Every Christian knows, yes, Jesus is our high priest. They might not know anything about that topic or even what it means. They just know that he is. Is what? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's typically how, how far we can get with them. It's like, uh, well, he's our high priest. What does that mean? Well, that he was the final sacrifice. It's like, well, doesn't that just mean that he's the sacrifice and not the high priest? It's like, how is he both? He killed himself? He's suicidal? Like, what are you talking about? Right? These are highly mystical concepts that, unfortunately, I mean this with love, but just very ed uneducated people get a hold of, and then they, they do whatever they want with them. And they pervert them, they corrupt them, turn them into these crazy... Uh, belief systems and new religions and just it's very sad what happened to these ideas because again at the root they're very kosher jewish mystical kabbalistic ideas so anyways getting into this idea that the tzaddik this the, the righteous person this really super righteous person is like a high priest and it should be remembered that the teacher of righteousness of the the, the qumran community the more tzaddik Again, remember, he is also called the high priest of the community. And we're finding that the Nazarene Ebionites also saw their Rebbe, their, their Tzaddik, their, their leader, their teacher, as a high priest of their community. And it shouldn't surprise us that, you know, there's the early Essene influences through John the Baptizer. There's the later Essene influences uh, in the early 2nd century, the early 100s. It shouldn't surprise us that this, ex that this belief exists within the Nazarene Ebionites, right? There's this double Essenization, but also it's curious that uh, there's also some Ebionization of the Essenes. So it's like, well, which one came first? It's a little hard to say. But given that the inner do that the, this doctrine of the inner temple exists within earlier Jewish sources, it almost certainly originated within both rabbinic and Essenic sources prior to the development of the Nazarene Ebionites. But anyway... Let's jump into some of these passages and wrap up the video. So in Hebrews 2, verse 17, it says about Jesus, it says, He became a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God. Again, this is spiritual language. This is allegorical language. And it might help us to imagine, you know, there's this temple in the sky and Jesus is dressed up like the Kohen Gadol. And, you know, there's clouds everywhere. But remember, this is a this is a picture of a spiritual reality. This is an allegory. That that picture is not actually going on. 
the inner kingdom, the inner Jerusalem, the inner temple, and the inner high priest exist within the human soul. Remember that. So, moving on to Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, we read, Since then we have a great high priest, who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who is, in every respect, has been uh, tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace, which, by the way, throne of grace is uh, it's a reference to the mercy seat, which is a reference to the Ark of the Covenant, which, again, it's kind of this Yom Kippur temple, holy of holies type of references and imagery that are being summoned up here. Draw near to the throne of grace, in other words, the Ark of the Covenant within the Holy of Holies, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. In Hebrews chapter 5, verses 5 through 10, we read, So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by God. And in the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. Wait, Jesus was praying and he was crying to God? Well, yeah, because he's the only one who could save him from death. Right? It wasn't himself. Jesus wasn't praying to himself. He wasn't crying to himself. He wasn't saying, oh, myself, save me. No, he's praying to the one that could actually save him, which is God. Right? This is what happens when we take a common sense approach to the text. Right? We come away with these crazy ideas that, you know, Jesus was a good Jew who prayed to God. <laughs> But you know, we won't get into that right now. And continuing with the text. And he was heard because of his reverence. So God only listened to Jesus' prayers because he was reverent. Right? Interesting. What's the model that's being set for everyone else? Right? And being made perfect. Wait, Jesus was made perfect? He had reverence for God? What's going on? He became, meaning that he was not originally, but he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. To all who believe in his name? To all who have faith in him? Who are saved by grace through faith? No. Who obey him. Right? Again, this is a very Jewish way of approaching Jesus. It of being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Right? So there's lots of things to unpack here. But for the sake of keeping this video short, which is... Very unlike me, I know. Uh, we're just going to move on to the next passages. Maybe we can hash out some of these things. Have a very friendly and non-hateful, loving, baselessly loving, uh, remember, Havas uh, Chinam, or Havat Chinam, kind of conversation down in the comments section below, which, as I always, I encourage. So continuing with our last slide of the presentation, we're going to look at Hebrews 6, verse 20 says, Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. In another passage, it says, Christ appeared as a high priest with the good things that have come, and then through the greater and more perfect tent, he entered once for all into the holy place, which is, uh, curiously, is plural, right? So, holy places. Uh, this is referring to the sanctuaries, right? As we know, there are seven heavens, and in each heaven there is a temple. We're not going to get into how that relates to the inner temple doctrine. Slightly different, but it's still very closely related. But we'll need many more videos for that. Needless to say, there are multiple sanctuaries. There are multiple heavenly temples, so to speak. Again, in a different passage, it says, For Christ has entered into heaven itself. Again, the kingdom of God is within you. He entered into the inner kingdom. He entered into himself, so to speak. For Christ has entered into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. And elsewhere it says, Since we have confidence to enter the holy places, plural, by the blood of Jesus, by the new and the living way that he opened for us, through the curtain that is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God. Right? Again, what does a priest do? He intercedes for the people, right? As the other passages said, he cried and prayed to God, and he showed God great reverence, 
This is what it means to be a priest. Supplicating to God, interceding on other people's behalves. Right? And actually, what's interesting, you actually find this type of thinking throughout Christianity. It's actually a kosher thing that's actually continued. Actually. How many times have I said actually? <laughs> it's actually been too much. But anyway. So, and this kind of all gets back to this idea, which we find present in Paul's writings, remember? As we saw in our last presentation. Paul writes that there is a mystery among the Gentiles, and that is, Christ is within you. How is this even possible? Because what Paul is doing is that he's expanding this doctrine of the inner temple, and he's saying, well, yeah, of course Jews. But you know what? Gentiles too. Non-Jews too. The nations of the world can also build their inner temples, become dwelling places for God. And there you go. They now have the priestly system up and running. They have the temple up and running. They have the presence of God. But again, these are all metaphorical things. All metaphorical things. These are allegories. These are spiritual realities that we're using this very human, limited, finite language to discuss. So for our purposes, we can still think about these in its, I might say they're, they're shadow forms. They're, uh, they're allegorical. Uh, it's not physicalized. I can't even think of a good word for it. But the allegorical versions of these ideas. We can continue to think about them because they are still very important. And with time, we'll begin to see what they really mean. This has been our fourth presentation, although it's the third lesson. I know that's confusing. I apologize. Sorry. But this has been our fourth presentation in our series on the doctrine of the inner temple. Hope you are doing well, and thank you for joining us. Thanks for getting to the end of this video. My goodness, what are you, interesting people or something? Probably. Anyways, have a good day.